Today we're taking apart the Asus 2080 Ti Strix video card, and for that we will need some tweezers, a Phillips screwdriver, and an anti-static wrist strap, but this is just so it doesn't get lost. Just to clarify, those are the new tips and tricks I learned from The Verge, so... Anyway, this is the first teardown we've done in a long time. This is an Asus 2080 Ti Strix. Finally getting back into the swing of things with video cards. Really looking forward to it. We'll have a lot of these coming up soon. So this card today is, is one of the first that we'll be working on. It just arrived, and they have several changes to it over the 1080 Ti Strix, which actually was one of the best performing cards in our benchmarks for the 1080 Ti's, primarily for noise normalized thermals, and we'll see if they can keep that crown with this card, and the first step of that is taking a look at what's inside. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzlies High-End Thermal Paste and Liquid Metal. Thermal Grizzlies Cryonaut is an affordable, high-quality thermal compound that doesn't face some of the aging limitations of other pastes on the market. Cryonaut has a thermal conductivity of 12.5 watts per meter kelvin, focuses on endurance, is easy to spread, and isn't electrically conductive, making it safe to use on GPU dyes. Thermal Grizzly also makes Conductonaut liquid metal, which we've used to drop 20 degrees off some temperatures in our delitted tests. Buy a tube at the link in the description below. So here are the two cards. This is the 1080 Ti Strix on my right and the 2080 Ti Strix on my left. They are overall the same for ID, but different in some of their other things here, like the fans. So the fans now have flow straighteners around the perimeter on the 2080 Ti Strix, which, and I think the 2080 as well. So flow straightener, in theory, it'll keep the air a bit more directed straight down, so there's less turbulent airflow out to the sides as it spins. How well that works, we'll see in testing. We don't actually know yet. Of course, wait till we can test it to buy anything, but that's one of the, the primary differences in the cooling design, other than the fact that the 2080 Ti uh, and the 2080 are significantly fatter than the 1080 Ti version. And that is because they moved to a 2.7 slot design on the 20 series cards with a much more substantial aluminum fin stack. And that is to deal with the more substantial power output of the 20 series card. So that's a big change as well. Uh, other than that, some small things. So Asus used to have this trick of putting a sticker on the card so that they could comply with NVIDIA's rules of getting NVIDIA branding on there, but also allow the user to remove it if they wanted to. And NVIDIA caught on. So that rule no longer broken or, or bypassed by Asus, unfortunately, if you wanted to get rid of the NVIDIA branding. This support beam has also been strengthened quite a bit, so it should help reduce sag. Of course, this isn't something we'll actually know about for quite a while, because it takes a while for cards to, to slowly sag and come apart, but uh, it is structurally resilient to it, and that's something we'll look at later. And then other than that, we'll start taking it apart in a moment, but a couple of things on the outside. There is a performance and a quiet mode toggle right here, and we have some stats on where the fan speeds will probably fall for that, but we'll save that for the review. And uh, going towards the back side is going to be performance, just if you're wondering. Has two 8-pin connectors. NVIDIA has new power balancing that should draw more even power out of each of these rather than leaning more heavily on one. And that's something that happened with Pascal and has changed with Touring in general for all of the Touring cards. And then on the back, they've got an LED on-off switch, which I think the marketing word for that is stealth switch, if you wanted to use their marketing language. So that's the outside of the card. Let's start taking it apart. This one should be pretty easy. It's got a total of six screws on the back side. So first four screws just go straight into the large aluminum block. And uh, the fin stack, rather, it should still have a copper, nickel-plated copper cold plate on it. We'll find out in a moment. But otherwise, all the fins are aluminum. Then we have these two just for support structure, screwing into the base plate on the other side. And we'll look at that in a moment, too. And in the back. All of these can stay in for now, but we do need to take out probably that one moment, or actually, we'll have to take out that one once we remove the base plate, but we can leave all of these in for now. Those are for the base plate removal. At this point, it should be a process of just pulling this thing up. Probably, yes. So some thermal paste tension, but we got it. And this is something I do like about the card already. So some of the cards, like EVGA is taking them apart. This isn't a big deal. It's not a deciding factor when you buy stuff. But fan headers that are vertical into the board and also have really short cables are kind of problematic because you get it a quarter of an inch off the card and then have to disconnect cables. Uh, this one, it just flips open, which is really nice. 
and the power connectors have an actual uh, push release latch on it, which is not standard. Uh, so we have broken these in the past, not the push release ones, but the more standardized power connectors, and that's not a problem here. Okay, so for the card itself, we'll go over the power design in a moment. But for now, you can see the base plate setup is pretty plain and simple. It's just a big structural bar on the sides to help with sag. That screws in separately through the rear I.O. and with screws all around the top plate, so that will be the next to be removed. We have a, a direct contact aluminum base plate with the memory modules here that's connected via thermal pads. And then the GPU itself contacting, of course, the cold plate which is nickel plated copper, if you were wondering. And that has several, these are, they look to be six millimeter heat pipes, but we'll double check in a second. And those are going through uh, the body. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six millimeter heat pipes going through. Uh, not all of them emerge the other side to go to the, the rest of the fins, but some of them do. And you can see it splits between uh, the different fin stacks, which are isolated in the center. So then we have contact with the MOSFETs and small parts around the MOSFETs. One thing you'll notice in a moment, there are actually no doublers on this card, so that's different for this generation. And something you'll see a lot more of from NVIDIA, uh, EVGA, and other vendors, they are moving away from traditional doublers and going with just a different PWM approach to the power phases and, and power stages. For the cooler, other than having a flow straightener around the sides of the fans, which it's going to be difficult to test how much that does, but we can try. Uh, it is fatter, so you can see it's pretty hefty. At 2.7 slots, this is going to be the new trend for a lot of these Turing cards, at least in the TI series, just for dealing with that 280-ish watts of, of heat coming off the card. Uh, so that is something we'll see more of, including from EVGA. It's time to take the base plate off, though, so we can start with the screws in the base plate. There are uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it looks like if you're keeping track. So for screw tracking, just to keep it simple, make sure it's all the screws go back where they should. We're just gonna move them over to our grid on the mod mat. If you haven't seen one of these before, it's on store.gamersnexus.net. You can pick one up. They should be on back order, but they're coming back into us this week. So they'll be back in stock soon for anyone who back orders them. And we only have a few left here. Oh, there's one more, 11. So there's a hidden screw in the bottom left over here my bottom left orientation. Okay, so we got all those out. The back plate's free, and next we have to loosen the I.O. Uh, screws, but let's get this LED off first. So for the back plate, there is no, uh, no contact via thermal pads. It's actually no contact really at all. It is primarily aesthetic for this one, uh, although it is aluminum, but it has a bit of a plating on it. So no thermal pad contact, not really doing any work for you in terms of cooling. It does have that LED strip on there if that's what you're interested in. And now we just need a couple more screws to get the base plate free. Okay, so we've got two more in here, smaller screwdriver for this, one down near the USB Type-C VR port that's never going to be used. And then one that's kind of stuck and free spinning because it doesn't seem like it's fully caught on threads, so we'll just start pulling it apart and see if, oh, there we go. Okay, some pressure helps. Okay, so some outward force got that one free, and I suppose it was free spinning because it was just caught on uh, the part that's not threaded there, but not a big deal. Okay, base plate should be free, and so is the I.O. cover. Okay. There we go. Pretty clean. Pretty clean card to take apart. All right, so here's what we have for the PCB. We'll talk about all the power components in a moment, but let's go with the layout first. For layout, the VRM is split between two sides, which is actually a bit, uh, it's really their only option here because they have such a large VRM, it wouldn't fit on a PCB otherwise. So they have part of the V-Core VRM over here, part of the V-Core VRM over here, and then a memory VRM up here, there's a three-phase memory. It is these top three uh, MOSFETs and chokes going for the VMEM VRM. We'll talk about vCore momentarily. For memory layout, 
you'll see that there are 11 modules. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. And that is because we have an 11 gigabyte card, so you end up with one gigabyte per module. There's a missing module, and part of this will explain, once we get the thermal paste off of here, the name on the GPU actually indicates which die, which memory, or memory module, rather, is missing from the card, because uh, it's not the same on all of them, but it will be the same for each identifier. So let's clean that off and figure out which one it is. So we had some spillover here. Some of these cards are hand done, depending on when they, well, the cards aren't hand done, but some parts of the cards are hand applied, like potentially thermal paste, depending on when they came out of the factory. And that's just because it's still so early. But we've cleaned off enough to reveal the GPU text and can do some more cleanup later before reassembly. But uh, we also know what thermal paste and thermal pads ASUS is using. So the thermal pads, at least for the primary VRM thermal pad, it is a 3 watt per meter Kelvin thermal pad. The thermal paste is TC5026 Dow Corning, and that is the same vendor that Intel and other companies use. A lot of them use Dow Corning for their thermal paste supply, so that's what that is. So this thermal paste is a non-curing compound. It should last for a long time, even with exposure to high heat and dust, potentially. It is also a 2.87, or roughly 3 watt per meter Kelvin thermal paste, not too abnormal for this kind of component either. We see a lot of 3 watt per meter Kelvin thermal paste on CPU coolers from ASTEC as well. There's a closer to 4. Intel uses closer to 4, something like that. So that's what they're working with. Now the GPU itself, let's look at the labeling. This is a TU-102. It's the first production TU-102 that we've worked with. Everything else has been pre-production. So this one is TU-102-300A. That's the name of the GPU. There may be later a 200A or something like that because this is actually uh, not the biggest Turing GPU they can make. It's, it's the biggest in terms of die size, but there's an additional four SMs that are disabled on here. So they could have another uh, 256 cores, 4 times 64 would get you 256 more floating point units. So we may see a 200A or a 400A later, but maybe 400A for some smaller card. Typically they go down a number for a larger card. So TU-102-300A, K1 is the signifier for which of these is missing. As we understand it now, we don't have enough samples to confirm that, but there is the one missing memory module here. And as I understand it today, that corresponds to the K1 part of the name, if you're wondering what that means. Uh, so we might see a K2, or maybe that one's missing instead, or something like that. We don't know why they do that. We don't know if it has to do with the memory controller or what, but that's, how, that's what the naming means. Then A1 is just the revision. So this is the first revision. That's all that is. The VRM, ASUS is using an MP2888 PWM controller with a switching frequency of 1600 kilohertz. The uh, PWM mode they are using, they're using PWM 10 mode for 16 phase. So there are no doublers here, as typically they would be in this line uh, between these caps and the MOSFETs. No doublers. So 16 phase uh, via the PWM controller. And then the power stages in here are CSD 95480s. They are 70 amp power stages. In total, they're looking at 1120 amps, which is quite high. And then the, uh, I think, Buildzoid might call it overkill, but we'll throw that to him for his analysis later. You'll find it on our channel, hopefully. And then the memory, so they've stepped down. They're using 60 amp per phase on memory, and it is a three phase, and that's these three up here. And then for the other uh, phases for vCore, you'll find those in this line and this line over here. One thing you might be asking about is why the chokes are sideways. So we're not sp exactly sure why ASUS decided to rotate these two chokes. All we know is that it's potentially going to be useful for a future design, but we don't know anything about what that design will be or why it needs them rotated. Maybe an LN2 card or something like that. Maybe it's some kind of LN2 pot clearance. We don't know. We're not sure. But they rotated these specifically for a future design, so this PCV will probably be used again. You'll probably see this VRM again. We just don't know what it'll be for yet. For the rest, they are using SAP chokes, and they're using a UP9512 buck controller. Uh, it has four, three, two, and one phase modes available. They've got a UP7651 for RTD and VIN power balancing and current steering with a block of four SMDs indicating that. Let me find that for you. So that would be this over here, this block of these small four service mount devices right there. Uh, that's going to be part of the VIN power balance 
and current steering, this small cluster here. And then the rest uh, we'll talk about hopefully in a Buildzoid video if we can get one for the rest of the VRM layout. On the back side of the PCB, there's not a whole lot going on, but we have some capacitors, rear of the GPU, of course, capacitors, on-off switch for the LEDs, LED plug, and that just goes into the ASUS I logo, so stuff we've all seen before for the most part. And that more or less sums it up. We've gotten pretty much everything, a couple small SMDs over here. So that's the ASUS card. That takes care of the PCB, the GPU itself, which we haven't formally shown a production sample, and the cooler, which is significantly larger. Thermal testing more or less done at this point, but we can't share the data yet. So. Uh, we'll, we'll let you know as soon as we're allowed to what the thermal performance looks like. We're testing all the cards and we'll have that data out pretty much in the immediate future. You'll, you'll know soon how well it does. We've also gone through most of the testing we needed to go through for cards leading up to today. So we have enough to start taking things apart and seeing how they're built at this point. Uh, and then finally the base plate I didn't really talk much about when we were in the teardown mode, but it's got thermal pads of course for the memory and then thermal pads for some of the VRM components on the other side. Uh, and that I think takes care of the base plate. It's really pretty straightforward. A lot of it is structural at this point for holding the card together and reducing sag. Small fins over here, always curious what that does because it, it seems like such a small thing that it is right above some MOSFETs and it's above where some MOSFETs contact the base plate, and there's even a small standoff uh, of the aluminum for those MOSFETs that the thermal pad is on top of. So it would help a bit in theory, it's just how much in practice does it really help. But that's the ASUS card. We already have data on some of it. We'll have data for uh, a lot of other cards coming up soon. Check back, subscribe if you're not already. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of the mod mats we used in this video or patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly. And thank you for holding out while we finish the office move. We're, we're back up and running now, so we have a lot of technical content coming up very shortly. This was the first of many. And make sure you come back for the rest. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.